Okay guys, so what we're going to have a look at in this video is the Haber process first of all and the most important an explanation of the conditions used in the Haber process. So if we have a look at the Haber process and what it's all about, it is the making of this compound which we have on the right hand side of the arrow here called ammonia, uh, uh, which has chemical formula of NH3. Uh, it's made from nitrogen and hydrogen and the photograph of the person below is a guy called Fritz Haber. He was the scientist who developed this process. He was originally a plumber and as we go through this uh, process hopefully you'll realise why his plumbing skills and understanding of how pipe work worked and pressure worked uh, were really quite vital in terms of being able to solve the problem of making ammonia. Ammonia is extraordinarily important and was even more important many years ago because it's one of the foundation uh, compounds for uh, artificial fertilizers so it was used and has been used to save many many thousand millions of lives in fact it's also the basis of and this is probably why it was originally developed by the germans in the world war but it is the basis of many uh, explosives as well so give them a big edge in the in the war so that's fritz haber who was the the uh, plumber turned chemist okay he would have some chemical training of course he wasn't just uh, a plumber okay right so this is what happened in the, the Haber process we'll just pull this up a little bit so you could look at it and I can talk you through it so we use our raw materials which are is nitrogen okay which simply comes from the air there is about 75 80 percent nitrogen and we get hydrogen which comes from natural gas okay if you take natural gas which is a uh, methane uh, you react it with steam okay high temperature what you get is really some carbon monoxide and you get some hydrogen uh, produced as well all right so the key thing is there is you get hydrogen you probably get a combination of carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide in that reaction but that's not a big deal the key thing is that we get hydrogen okay we take those gases together and we react them we feed them in at a temperature of about 450 degrees Celsius, a pressure of about 200 atmospheres, so relatively high temperatures, relatively high pressures, and we use an iron catalyst. That iron catalyst exists in sort of beds or rows of catalysts, and it's very finely divided catalyst. It's um, usually as a as a gauze, G A U Z A. Sorry, I messed a bit of that off. The reason why it's as a gauze, a gauze is sort of a, a mesh, if you like, of metal finely divided metal a bit like a, a brillo pad if you get a brillo pad and, and pull it all out um, and the reason for using that is very simply because the reactions take that, that do occur in here between the nitrogen and the hydrogen occur on the surface of the catalyst and if you have a catalyst with a massive surface area okay you get far more reactions occurring if I just use a solid lump of iron you would only get reactions on the surface there if I take this and pull it out into finely divided wires then I get a much greater uh, places for reactions to take place and it increases the speed of the reaction which is what a catalyst is essentially meant to do. You might say well why not use a powdered catalyst then um, instead of using a gauze catalyst because a powder would obviously produce even greater surface area. Well actually it, it doesn't really if you think of a powder if I had a bed of catalyst and I covered in powdered iron, really the the uh, the nitrogen and hydrogen have great difficulty penetrating deep into that bed of powdered iron. It would just sit and almost be like a solid. The other thing is because this is going at 200 atmospheres, there's quite a lot of pressure, so there's a lot of gases flowing through this system. Okay, at relatively high speeds, and the gases as they went through would just pick up the powdered iron and take them with it, and you get a product filled with powdered iron. So, powdered catalysts themselves have problems associated with them. So, when those two things react, the nitrogen and the hydrogen in here, they form liquid ammonia, and what happens is that the well, it actually comes out as a gaseous ammonia, they cool it that way down, and when it's cooled down, it turns into liquid ammonia. And you just remove that and put it into uh, some sort of cylinder or collection vessel. And then any nitrogen and hydrogen that are unreacted, well, they simply go back through the system. And they keep pumping them through and through and through until they have all reacted. Or as many, much of them have reacted as possible. So there's a, a sort of a, a diagrammatical representation of the, uh, the 
plant that would be used in order to produce the ammonia. And if you pause the video you can sort of have a little look through it. There's the, the feed gases as they're called in the industry. They come in the compressor, builds up the pressure, they go through the catalyst beds here. Okay, you pre-warm the gases first of all through a heater and they go through the catalyst beds. Remember in the previous period it said they had to get up to about 450 degrees Celsius for the activation energy of the reaction to be reached. That's also the optimum temperature for the catalyst here to work at. Catalysts themselves work at particular temperatures. This one happens to work at around 450 degrees Celsius and then they, they come back through through a heat exchanger. Any nitrogen and hydrogen are recycled. So heat exchanger just means that it takes the, the heat back out of it, cools it down. Okay, and then your ammonia, your liquefied ammonia is condensed and cooled and any nitrogen and hydrogen just make their way back through the system again. Okay. Right, so that's that you can have a pause and have a look at that if you're interested. So what we need to look at is to be able to explain the conditions of this process. So let's have a look first of all again. We'll go back um, and we'll have a look at the, the reaction. So here's our equation. Now there's a few things that we need to first of all note about this equation. First of all, everything in it is in gaseous state. Okay. The second thing is, and it's not in here because it's not a chemical, the reaction is exothermic. It gives out heat, so it has a delta H, which is of course negative. Okay. Right, so well, the first thing that we will do is we'll talk about why do we use a catalyst? Why do we use an iron catalyst? That's the easiest thing really to explain. And that, of course, reduces um, the temperature, just write degrees C for temperature. And why is that important? Well, if you reduce the temperature, okay, you decrease expense. You save money because temperature always requires some source of energy, so maybe electricity or solid fuel or coal or oil, something like that. Okay, well, what else? Well, it speeds the reaction up. And if you're trying to make a product, a product um, to sell, the quicker you could produce that product, the better. So that, of course, would increase your your profits. And if you can find a catalyst which speeds up an uh, industrial reaction you're going to be a fairly uh, well sought after chemist. Okay, so that's why, um, then if we look at the temperature, why is the, the temperature, okay, and the temperature in here is relatively high at 450 degrees Celsius. Well, one of the main reasons here is that it is the optimum temperature, so again, optimum degrees Celsius of the catalyst. So the catalyst works best at that temperature. A bit like the catalytic converter in your car. Uh, it doesn't work so well until your car gets warmed up in the morning and then it becomes much more effective. Okay. Um, the other thing is in order to get it to work at 450 degrees Celsius that is because you will increase the rate of the reaction. Okay. So, what happens there is that if you'd run it at a very low temperature, the the rate would be very, very slow. It would be so slow, it would take you far too long to make the ammonia, and the whole process would become unprofitable. You might say, well, okay, well then why not run it at, at maybe, let's say, a thousand degrees Celsius, because a thousand degrees Celsius fairly obviously would increase the rate even further. Well, if you run it at a thousand degrees Celsius, Unfortunately, what happens is that it just becomes too expensive. And you may well make your ammonia quite quickly, but unfortunately it becomes so expensive you couldn't, no one would buy your ammonia. So that's the reason why you don't run it at a really high temperature. You don't run it at a really low temperature. And then you might say, well, run it, why not run it at 50 degrees Celsius? Because that would be nice and cheap. Well, it would be nice and cheap, but it would be far too slow and you would have to wait far too long in order for the ammonia to be made and again it would simply become uneconomical. Okay well then we have pressure so if we look in here okay 
the pressure is, is about two, roughly 200 atmospheres, depends what textbook you read. And why do we run it at 200 atmospheres? Well, let's have a look. First of all, we've got gases here, and if you put run gases at high temperature, those gaseous particles are going to collide with each other. And if they collide with each other, they will react. So we run it at 200 atmospheres again, okay, to increase the rate of the reaction. And again, you might say to me, well, okay, well, why do you not run it at, let's say, 1,000 atmospheres of pressure? Well, 1,000 atmospheres of pressure, if we remember our system that we had in our industrial system, this is a system full of pipes. Okay, if you're going to run this at a high pressure, you've got to build a much more robust plant. That costs an awful lot of money. You'd be amazed at the increase in cost if, as, as you increase the, uh, the pressure, the thickness of the pipe, the quality of the pipe, the material the pipe's made of all the valves, all the compressors, everything in there has got to be a much higher grade and higher quality and those costs just become prohibitive. Um, again, it would mean you would have to sell your ammonia for uh, a quantity of money that people quite simply wouldn't pay. Um, then the other problem is with very high temperatures, or sorry, very high pressures is that it becomes a health and safety issue. High pressures are difficult to control, they can cause explosions, they can cause leaks, so Manufacturers, if they can avoid working at high pressures, okay, they will do so. And the other thing about high pressure, okay, is we'll just write that down actually, is that it's also expensive. It takes energy to create pressure, so they become very expensive. Okay, they can be quite dangerous. Okay, and your plant, okay will also become very expensive. Your factory, if you like, will also become very expensive. So those are all what we call rate considerations. Okay, in other words, the speed of the reaction considerations. Okay, you might say then, um, why not run it at a really low pressure? So why not run it at 20 atmospheres? Well, again, a rate consideration. The fact is that the rate will become extremely slow. It may well be cheap. It may well be much less dangerous. You may well be able to build a less expensive plant, but unfortunately your rate of your reaction will become slow, slow, it will take you so long waiting for ammonia, you're paying people to stand around in a factory doing very little while your ammonia is being made extremely slowly, so again you're losing money. Right, and that's all the rate considerations. If we look then at the what we call equilibrium considerations, I'm just going to clear this off now, um, and we'll look at the equilibrium Okay, so equilibrium considerations. If we remember earlier, we spoke about the fact that this was an exothermic reaction. In other words, it produces heat. Well, let's look at why, because of equilibrium considerations. So not rate considerations anymore that we sort of spoke about a few seconds ago. Okay, and the equilibrium considerations are if we look at this arrow here, if you can remember from studies earlier in the year, what does this arrow tell us? Well, this arrow tells us very simply that the reaction can take place in the forward direction. In other words, nitrogen can react with hydrogen to make ammonia. Of course, that's how we've always been learned or taught to interpret chemical uh, equations. But also, this time, the ammonia molecules can collide with each other, decompose back into these uh, original reactants. We do not want that to happen. You want, as a chemist or a chemical engineer, for the forward reaction to be the predominant reaction. You want your reactants that you've paid money for to turn into product, which is something that you can actually sell. So in other words, what we would say is we want the equilibrium to lie towards the RHS, which is the right-hand side, and we want it to move from the left-hand side, okay, left-hand side of the arrows, what I'm talking about, over to the right-hand side. So how do we actually do that? Well, the first thing is that if is if I have a reaction which is giving out heat, okay, what I can do is I can remove that heat. So if I cool the reaction down, that takes the heat away, okay. And what that does is if any change that you make to an equilibrium, the equilibrium will try and adjust to compensate for that change. So what am I saying there is basically that if I take the heat away, the equilibrium 
will try to produce heat. Well, how does it produce heat? Well, very simply, it produces reacts nitrogen with hydrogen to produce ammonia, but also produce heat. So in other words, if I cool the reaction down, the reaction, the equilibrium will move to the right-hand side to replace the heat that I have removed. So therefore, if I was to say, what are the optimum conditions? Well, the optimum conditions for this is fairly, a, definitely, a low temperature. Because low temperatures remove heat, remove heat, nitrogen and hydrogen will try and react together to replace the heat that you have removed. Okay, but why do I not use low temperature? Well, if we go back to what we talked about earlier, okay, this has a rate implication. The rate is now far too slow. Okay, so you may make more ammonia as a, an equilibrium may move to the right, but you have to wait far too long in order for that to happen. And again, you might say, okay, well, that's fine. Why not use a higher temperature? Well, okay, the higher temperature then, the equilibrium, if you use a high temperature, that means you're putting heat in. So what does the equilibrium try to do? Well, the equilibrium, in this instance, will try and take heat away. So if you use high temperature, you put heat in, how does it take heat away? It reacts it, sorry, it reacts it with ammonia and turns it back into nitrogen and hydrogen. So in other words, if you put heat in, the equilibrium shifts back to the left-hand side and you get hardly any ammonia produced. So you use what's called a compromise temperature. And that compromise temperature is the 450 degrees Celsius that we spoke about. Okay, so a low temperature will give you lots and lots of ammonia because the equilibrium will shift to the right, but it will be really, really slow. A high temperature will give you a really quick, fast rate of reaction, but it will give you hardly any ammonia because the equilibrium will move back to the left-hand side. Okay, so that is... The other thing is that we said that earlier that the iron catalyst works well at 450 degrees Celsius. So that's our compromise temperature. Now let's have a look at the pressure then and explain why do we use this pressure of about 200 atmospheres. Okay, well let's look at this from an equilibrium point of view. We'll just tidy this up a little bit. Okay, so let's explain this. Pressure. Now, the first thing that we need to know here, and we may or may not know this yet, is that if you increase the pressure, the equilibrium, okay, will move to the side. Of fewer molecules. So. Let's have a look. We have again, we split this in two, obviously. Left hand side, right hand side, molecules here. One, three. So total, four. Right hand side, two. So therefore, if I increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to the side with the least molecules, so it'll shift to. So at a high pressure, the equilibrium will shift to the right hand side and that's exactly what you want as an industrial chemist you want to make ammonia so therefore you might say well why not use a really high pressure well we've already sort of discussed the reasons why uh, and the reasons are very simply that you will not you may get more ammonia but it's a health and safety and an expense consideration there so again the 200 atmospheres of pressure okay 200 atmospheres of pressure are a compromise condition, a compromise pressure. You might say, well, why not use a, a really low pressure then? Okay, and again, if you use a really low pressure, the opposite happens. The equilibrium at a high pressure shifts to the side of fewer moles, so at a low pressure, it shifts to the side where you have more moles. And you have more moles, in this instance, on the left-hand side. So if you use a low pressure, okay, you will shift the equilibrium back to the left hand side and you'll get very little ammonia. Okay, now, though, so again, a compromise condition. Okay, so this is a graph here that examiners will uh, frequently ask you to analyze. And what it has is uh, the pressure along the uh, x axis here. Okay, and you have percentage 
of ammonia at equilibrium. So obviously the higher the percentage of ammonia that you have at equilibrium, the better your yield. Okay. So I've put a line on here at about 250 degrees Celsius. And if we look at above 250 degrees Celsius, okay, we could get a higher yield if we use this temperature here, the, the purple temperature, which would be 300. We get an even higher yield if we used a temperature at 200. But if you remember, we ruled both of those out because we said the reaction there would be far too slow. So even though the graph shows a much better percentage yield of ammonia, it takes far too long for ammonia to be produced and therefore it becomes economically unfeasible. We'd said earlier as well that we could use a higher temperature to speed the reaction up. But if you look at the higher temperatures here, we're looking here really the 500 and 600 lines. It is a very fast reaction, yes. But unfortunately now our yield is too small. We have too small a yield. So therefore this temperature line here is our compromise temperature and it gives us sort of a reasonable yield and a reasonable rate. Okay, if we look then at um, our our pressure, okay, so this is our, our pressure line here, so we're at 250, sorry, 250 atmospheres of pressure here, and you might say, okay, well, why not work at a higher pressure, okay, up to 600? Well, if you look at the difference here between working at about 250 and working at about 600, you're really talking about moving from 40% yield up to about 50. So the expense of running at this much higher pressure would be outweighed by the increase in the yield. And if you think about it, if you look back to our graph or our industrial setup that we had here, <coughs> what you'll see is any gases that don't react simply get recycled and put back through. So there's no point in putting the pressure up to 600 atmospheres to convert another 10% of your reactants because it will cost so much, it would make the process so much more expensive and actually all you have to do really is just recycle your unreacted gases so that saves you an awful lot of time, money and hassle. Okay and again you might say well why don't you run it at this, this these lower pressures down here well, if you go to the lower pressures, you start to find that the percentage yield starts to taper off and fall off really quite rapidly. Okay, so again, your 250 atmospheres or 200 atmospheres of, of pressure um, is adequate. So sort of 200, 250, that's, that's the pressures that these process, or this process, sorry, tends to, to work at. So again, you've got a... a, a compromise pressure not too low okay again the reaction will be slow and the yield again would also be be slow or be low sorry okay so I hope that explains and really the equilibrium arguments that I've spoken about there are guys in terms of pressure in terms of temperature can be applied to any equilibrium you'll find them applied to uh, the nitric or the formation of sulfuric acid in the contact process uh, to a certain extent nitric acid in the Oswald process. Um, the Haber process is the only one that's on the uh, syllabus in terms of understanding the equilibrium and the rate arguments but you may well be given an unfamiliar process during the exam and have to apply these ideas to that equilibrium reaction. Okay I hope this helps.